Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. And today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to talk about Major General Smedley Butler's essay. I think it's an essay. He calls it a book, but I'm not going to call it that. His essay, War is a Racket. Yes. I bought it from Amazon. Took a couple of days to ship. I'm sorry. I I bought it from Jeff Bezos. It's like one fourth of this book. The rest is an introduction and a photo essay. And it's real short. It's a afternoon's read. Yeah, I just found a, I found a PDF of it online. It's 12 pages that I've got here. I've been wanting to read this for a long time since I became aware of it. Here's what attracted me to it. The title's awesome. And then it's written by Major General Smedley Butler, who won the Medal of Honor one. You don't win it. It's not a game. He was awarded the Medal of Honor twice. Highly decorated fellow, was involved in Spanish-American War, Boxer Rebellion in China, kind of that weird late 19th century Monroe Doctrine stuff that we were playing with over here in the United States, then was uh, involved in World War I and then retired and then became a political activist. He ran for um, Senate, kind of a rabble rouser and an interesting guy. So the title of it is War's Racket, and it's written by a four-star general who was involved in the First World War. And I thought, golly, I got to read this someday. This podcast has become my reading list. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like I don't have any time to read anything else. So I, I, I snuck him in just because I wanted to. It was interesting. I, I have My pleasure reading has kind of gone away because it's like, what do I have to read for next week? I have this Joe Abercrombie book that I'm just inching through. It's like two pages mm. a day, maybe. I usually love his stuff, but I'm like, I got to read McIntyre for next week. Yeah. <sighs> We're doing good stuff, but you, you, dear listener, should realize we're really... What's a good expression for working hard? What would they say in Katusa? Uh, there's all kind of, they're all dirty. Uh, well, we're, we're getting after it over here. Yeah. Nose to the grindstone. Always reading to try to make this show good for you. I thought it was interesting. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. Shots fired right there. In the opening paragraph, it's a good opening paragraph, this professional soldier, this very excellent soldier, thinks it's all fake. That wakes you up, right? That's interesting. It's fake. (laughs) Sure. I mean, we've been at war as long as I can remember. With East Asia? Yeah. Yeah. When's the last time the United States was not involved in armed conflict somewhere? There might have been a little bit of a stretch between 1918 and uh, maybe 38, but we've been occupying foreign territories unbroken since, uh, well, since he was awarded the Medal of Honor or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, I sent you a picture today that uh, Cassandra Fairbanks had posted of an America First group from 1941 I put it in the Slack channel, where they had they had quotes from FDR talking about not getting involved in foreign wars, and it's five days after Pearl Harbor, and they're taking it all down. Yeah, taking the posters down, memory hole and that stuff. Yeah. So uh, this happened before this. This book, the copyright's nineteen thirty five. It's the middle of the Great Depression. This is uh, an attempt to get the United States not to go to war anymore. Because it's a racket. Well, what's a racket? Yeah, I don't, I, I've got a sense of what a racket is. An illegitimate, cartelized, money-making scheme? It makes money for somebody, but it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Yeah, it doesn't provide v- value to the consumer. Right. If the dry cleaner is running a brothel out of the back, that might be a racket. Well, I don't know. Those Johns might be getting their dollars worth. 
But what if the dry cleaner uh, is watering down the uh, dry cleaning solution and the clothes really don't come out clean and then they kill all the other dry cleaners and then they charge you extra? Oh, yeah. That would be a racket. That would be a racket. Or if you uh, you went to the bar and you weren't getting bourbon, you were getting gin with brown food coloring. <laughs> That's a racket. So it's deceptive then? Yeah. Under, <laughs> under oaked. Did you have some of that weird barrel aged gin? I did. I was the only one who liked it. The yeah, gin in, in bourbon barrels. It, it's an interesting thing. The floral combined with the oak. Yeah. I liked it. Nobody else did. Smedley, General Butler, Smedley Darlington Butler. That's the name, <laughs> That's by the great. way. That's a fantastic name. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of people. Only a small inside group knows what it is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. So that's a racket. Something that is only benefiting a few people and is to the expense of lots of other people. A war would be a racket in that, I suppose... Doesn't have to be, though, right? Does a war have to be a racket? No, I don't think so. I think a a war to defend your your territory is not a racket. If Canada invaded uh, North Dakota, don't get any ideas. <laughs> we may seem disorganized, but you Canadians, be careful. Uh, but if they invaded North Dakota then it would be legitimate to defend, I think, to defend your territory. But there are probably people, even in the case of a legitimate war, a just war, there are people that could be allowed to take advantage of that state of emergency that the country is in, charge what they will, provide poor quality supplies and accoutrement, well, and just take advantage of the whole entire entire situation. Right. So if you're going to go to war at the great, the upcoming Battle of Fargo, okay, somebody needs to write that novel. At the Battle of Fargo, you're going to need armaments. You're going to need uh, probably uh, cold weather skis. I don't know. I don't know what the battle's going to be like. Will it be in the dead of winter, like from the movie Fargo? You have to buy the wood chipper. The Canadians would be at a, a tactical advantage if they did attack in the depths of winter. Right, so we would have like a, a snow gap that we would have to overcome. Yeah. So the parka manufacturers might make some money. Does that make it a racket? Not if they make some, but here in World War I, he says there were 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires made in the United States at that time. And that's when a million dollars would get you something. Yeah. A million ain't nothing now. Can you imagine in 1915, a million dollars? How many loaves of bread would that buy? All of them. All, all of the bread. Yeah, so people get rich during wars. Uh, well, because war consumes a lot of stuff. Well, let me read a paragraph from Butler, and then we'll see if, if you think he's uh, he's right. So he's, how many of these war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat-infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless, frightened nights ducking shells and shrapnel machine gun bullets? How many of them parried the bayonet thrust of an enemy? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle. Okay, so the, does the Parker manufacturer need to go in a trench? Eh, may, probably not, I mean, especially if he's the finest Parker maker in the land, and we need Parkas. Maybe that's the biggest contribution he could make to the effort, perhaps. By the way, I just got out the U.S. inflation calculator, and I typed in, $1 million in 1915 is worth $25 million and change now. The cumulative rate of inflation since then has been 2,438%. How did that happen? I don't know. Hmm. Actually, I do know. <laughs> we might talk about that, too. What about this, though? What if the parka manufacturer is part of a group that is promoting tensions with Canada? Hmm. What if, they are in, what if they hire Edward Bernays, who did this sort of work? We're not making this up. Yep. You can look it up. What if they hired Edward Bernays, the founder of the public relations, to foment war with Canada so that they can sell parkas? Is it a racket then? Yep, I think so. He gives lots of examples of some of this kind of um, largesse in Chapter 2. I don't want to just breeze through this. Um, 
but he gives a bunch of examples like your parka example. He says, Utah Copper, they average $5 million per year in profit between 1910 and 1914, and it jumped to $21 million per year during the war period. So their their profits went up by f- over a factor of four. Let's see, U.S. Steel, um, their profits over doubled annually during the wartime period compared to the ten, the four years leading up to the war. He gives he gives example after example. Total yearly average profits of the pre-war period were one hundred and thirty-seven million dollars, and this is over uh, uh, kind of, it's not the Dow Jones, but he he selected a portfolio of companies. The average yearly profits for that same group during the wartime went up to four hundred and eight million. So from one hundred and thirty-seven to four hundred and eight million profits. Uh, increased approximately 200%. Hmm. Central Leather Company was making saddles. They went from making about $1.1 million a year to $15 million a year, an increase of 1,100% during World War One. Mm. And just example after example. Yeah, that's pretty good work if you can get it. If you could get 1,100% return on your investments, what might you do? What are you willing to do to get 1,100% return? We just need a war. Right. Yeah. Um, Point the finger at the Hun. And uh, Yeah, I have heard, I have heard, and uh, the Bernays book reinforced that, that the people weren't really too concerned about the Germans. The people of America, they had to be made to hate them. It was done on purpose. There was no particular desire of the United States to get into World War I. No. Not of the people, but of certain people, yeah. Teddy Roosevelt, for sure, you know. I don't know what the where the leather company was. Smedley makes some comments about bankers. I wish he'd given some sources on this. He talks about the Liberty Bonds and, and claims that there was bond manipulation. And I did a little research and I wasn't able to find anything concrete on that. Yeah, so the soldiers were paid so much a month. They were paid so much a month, and then they would have to pay a little bit of tax out of that. And they were forced to send a certain amount of that home to mom or wife or or whatever. And then they also had to buy accident insurance for uh, $6 a month. That left him $9 a month out of his $30 a month pay. He got a dollar a day. He says, the soldier was virtually blackjacked into paying for his own ammunition, clothing, and food by being made to buy Liberty Bonds. Most soldiers got no money at all on paydays. We made them buy Liberty Bonds at $100, and then we bought them back when they came back from the war and couldn't find work at 84 and 86 bucks. And the soldiers bought about $2 billion in those bonds. Yeah, Carl, I don't know that we actually need a citation on that. I mean, we, well, there is one citation that we would need. If you sell a bond into a flooded market and the returns on those bonds are low, you're going to receive a less than par value so that the buyer can get the return that they want. So there doesn't have to be any particular banker that would have paid $83, $84, $86 for a $100 par value bond for this to be true. And so you you get a bunch of men who buy $2 billion worth of bonds that come home from World War I and then the bottom falls out of the economy. You can imagine that there were millions of people trying to dig into their savings to get through the great depression. And apparently there was $2 billion worth of savings there at the fingertips of these soldiers. I'm sure they flooded the market with those bonds. That's where uh, Butler lost me a little bit was the grumbling about the banks as if they were doing evil things. But then I want to know what evil things they did. And the fact that the bond prices were low doesn't mean necessarily that they did evil things. Yeah, if 35 guys walk up to you and they say, hey, buy my bonds, you're going to buy it from the lowest bidder. Yeah, it's it's a buyer's market. I think that's what happened. Yeah. But, but you know, listen, these soldiers, they got trench foot, lost limbs, uh, got, had their minds damaged, so on. And then uh, hard times come and uh, the government wasn't there to backstop them. They're losing 12 to 16% off the par value of those bonds when they sell them in the face of hard times. The free market people would say, yeah, screw them. Get market value for those things. 
Well, they should have known before they went to war, right? right? Except, except they're conscripted. They're conscripted. And okay, so I want to re- I want to look at a paragraph here. This is in chapter three of my book. Up to and including the Spanish American War, we had a prize system, and soldiers and sailors fought for money. I remember this from reading Horatio Hornblower books. You get prize money when you take the enemy ship. So everybody on the ship gets money. Seems very weird to us today. But maybe it's not so weird. During the Civil War, they were paid bonuses in many instances before they went into service. The government or the states paid as high as $1,200 for an enlistment. In the Spanish-American War, they gave prize money. When we captured any vessels, the soldiers all got their share. At least they were supposed to. Then it was found, I wonder by whom, that we could reduce the cost of wars by taking all the prize money and keeping it, but conscripting the soldier anyway. Then the soldiers couldn't bargain for their labor. Everyone else could bargain, but the soldier couldn't. So there's one point right there. I think this is some hard stuff that, that's worth thinking about. Uh, when you have a draft, the soldiers don't have any power to say no. It's slavery. They don't have any power to demand any better pay. Yeah, it's a heck of a thing. I remember finding out that draftees got paid. I was young, you know, 10, 12 years old or something like that, and found out that draftees got paid. And I was surprised <laughs> because it's just, even though they get paid, it's still slavery. Yeah, because they can't quit. They can't quit. And, you know, if you desert, you know, you might get hung, you might get shot. You know, it's, uh, if you run away, well, there's no underground railroad, is there, for conscriptees? Is it necessarily slavery? This is a strong term. Is there a case where you might need to have a draft? I don't know. The Canadians are overrunning the border in force. You know, all 20 million of them are coming in through Fargo. Okay? We don't have that big of an army. We need to get people there. We have to raise them quickly. We need conscription. Okay, that's where I think maybe. Well. Maybe. But if the threat's real and genuine and you have an honest media, and people get real information, there's a lot of ifs there, Uh then you ought to get volunteers. There ought to be enough volunteers to meet the threat. But what if there aren't volunteers? Maybe you don't get to keep your country. You you lose it either way, Carl. Mm Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Maybe you don't get to keep Fargo if you can't get enough people to go defend it. Yeah. Maybe it was never yours to begin with if you can't do that. I, I don't know. I really don't know. Maybe maybe there are instances where you need to conscript. Yeah, but if there were, so let's say there were, we make an edge case where there is. Aliens are invading. I don't know. Mm. Not Canadian aliens, but alien aliens. And, and you need a whole lot of people in a hurry, and you can't wait for public opinion and votes. That's like the, always the claim, right? You can't wait. You can't go to the legislature. It takes too long. There's an emergency, don't you know? We got to ha- Maybe there's some cases there. But if that's the case, and this is where I, Butler's book shines, sometimes it's like a cranky old guy. Mm-hmm. He wasn't that old, but cranky old guy um, railing at the banks. But this is where it's at its best. Gosh, if you were commander in chief, president. President Hambrick, your commander in chief, mm-hmm. and your advisors say we need to go to war, and you're going to spend all of these lives. Wouldn't you be very careful where you would go and what you would do? I think so. I would, in your instant, in your example, I would a hundred percent challenge Justin Trudeau to a duel with sledgehammers to settle the whole thing. <laughs> would you let him hit first? You just trade blows. Would I let him hit first? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't think he would hit that hard. No, probably not. A few harsh words would take care of him, I think. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, just, I'm imagining the picture. Uh, what a fruit that guy is. All of these problems with conscription and this being a racket and all of that. I, I say all of the problems. A lot of the problems would be clear, cleaned up if we uh, use the Starship Troopers model of citizenship. They yeah, solve a whole bunch of this. Yeah, I wonder if Heinlein read this thing. Hmm. It'd be about the time he was getting out of the Navy. I bet he did. Uh, that uh, to have people who have no stake in the downside of the war and making decisions about the war. 
you know, let's go to war with Canada. Well, are you going to be there? No, I'm, I'm not going to be there. But all of these middle America kids, we're going to send them up to Fargo to, to have the battle of Stalingrad against Canada. We're doing our part with our park of manufacturing concern. Yeah. So the bit about the, the conscripted soldiers is, is a hard thing to think about. And, and that law is still on the books. Um, you have to sign up for selective service. I don't believe the ladies do unless they recently changed that. But all the young men have to sign up for it, which means if there's a draft, they know who you are. Yeah. He says, uh, we don't pay them money anymore. We give them medals. Uh, he brings up this line. I, I had remembered Napoleon said this. All men are enamored of decorations. They positively hunger for them. So Napoleon would go around the battlefield. And if he saw somebody doing something great, he would just... I, was it the Legion of Merit? Somebody will tell us. He just yeah. pinned it on somebody on the battlefield. And the great man has given me a, a, has acknowledged me. And they would fight harder. They wouldn't get paid anymore, but they, they'd fight harder. And so we have, uh, he says, until the Civil War, there were no medals. Then the Congressional Medal of Honor was handed out. It made enlistments easier. That's interesting. In the World War... We used propaganda to make the boys accept conscription. They were made to feel ashamed if they didn't join the army. Yeah, one of the things that I learned about that has made me super, super angry is about these white feather girls. That there were these women, um, typically they were suffragettes, who would put a white feather in the buttonhole or in the hat band of of a military age man that they saw walking on the streets and it was a, it, and shame them for not being in the military. You know what? If I was that age and a pretty girl put a, a flower in my buttonhole or a feather in my buttonhole and shamed me, I'd probably would have signed up. Shame me. I probably slapped the shit out of her. But, uh, you know, this is the problem that Heinlein's trying to deal with, with his modest proposal that he makes the propaganda. He, he makes a, Butler makes a direct reference to the propaganda of World War I where he says this was the, quote, war to end all wars. And this was, quote, the war to make the world safe for democracy and got those young men to go to war. And he says, no one told these American soldiers that they might be shot down by bullets made by their own brothers here. No one told them that the ships on which they were going to cross might be torpedoed by submarines built with United States patents. They were just told it was going to be a glorious adventure. I circled that and underlined it three or four times and almost scratched a hole in the paper. We have given our manufacturing capability and technology away to the point that uh, we have taught our enemies how to do everything they need to do to kill all of us. Maybe our enemies could have figured those things out on their own, but I sure would have liked them had to have figured it out on their own without all of our manufacturing concerns here in the United States outsourcing. When you outsource the specialty product that you make to another country, you essentially will have to teach that manufacturer overseas how to do what you were doing. And we have given away, we've given everything away. 80% of our medications I've read are not made here anymore. We're at gra in grave, grave danger. Well, what's the benefit to that? So th let's go back to the definition of a racket. Dear listener, <laughs> If you read this thing, it's going to make you mad, I think. Why would we ship everything over to other places? To whose benefit is it? The fat cats. I, I mean, there, the there's talk about economic efficiency and free trade and how it's going to make everybody get richer. And I, I don't know. I don't know. It makes some people a lot richer. I've been thinking about this problem. Carl, should we read your disclaimer? Is now a good time to read your disclaimer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure, I have to pull it up. Where's my disclaimer? I wrote a disclaimer because, you know, we say stuff here, and you might disagree with it. Yeah, go ahead. And, well, here's what I wrote. This is a draft. The opinions I express on the podcast are not necessarily the opinions of OGB. In fact, they couldn't be, because OGB is not a person and can't hold opinions. What is an opinion anyway? Is it a statement about reality that's deduced or inferred from available evidence? Then it's not an opinion, it's a judgment. If you don't like it, give contrary evidence or show the error. If opinion is a statement about reality that's not deduced or inferred from available evidence, then why do you have opinions anyway? They seem like bad things. 
Here, here. I agree. As far as anybody can, I guess I own online great books, but I don't need any seminars there. I do tangle with people in Slack some, and uh, I think that's part of my job, but I, online great books doesn't have any views. No, no official views, uh, except you ought to read some books and come talk about them. Yeah, and, and to have a conversation about important things, you have to believe that there's such a thing as truth. So if you're willing to read the books, you're willing to be a goodwill discussion partner, and you believe that there's such a thing as truth, it's game on. That's it. That's all we want. And so if you don't like the feelings that I have today about conscription and maybe we ought to give Fargo back to the Canadians, that's fine. Wait a minute. Did they ever have Fargo? By default. I don't okay. know. They're spiritually <laughs> Canadian in Fargo. <laughs> don't you know? That's fine. Then, then figure out what, what facts led me to my conclusion. What did I get wrong? What judgments did I make that were not wrong? The, the problem with opinions is opinions are like your taste in ice cream. You say, I like vanilla. Hell with you, I like chocolate. You're wrong. You don't like chocolate. <laughs> no, that, that's stupid. Opinions are stupid. Judgments are what we want, okay? I judge that if Canada really wanted Fargo, we might just want to let them have it. You, especially if we couldn't raise a volunteer army big enough to defend it, you think I'm wrong. Tell me where I'm wrong. And I will say, thank you. Yeah, I change my mind all the time. I won't be mad. So here's the thing I was going to say that might make people angry. Uh-oh. This free trade argument that you'll read in like Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt or in Adam Smith. It's been a long time since I've read either of those, but it kind of goes like this. Countries have comparative advantages. I think the Adam Smith argument is the English are very good at creating woolen textiles. The French are very good at making wine. They can each make superior products at lower prices compared to the other. The French or the English aren't good at making cheap tasty wine. So it's to the benefit of each of those countries to focus on what they are best at. And then when they trade their profit margins on the things that they are best at will be greater than if they had tried to create sub substandard wines in uh, Yorkshire <laughs> and both countries would benefit. Sounds good. But okay. what if at the base of the competitive advantage that one country has over another in their trade isn't in their climate or their natural resource, which would be maybe wool or good grape growing weather in soil, but it's the fact that their labor costs almost nothing. If you can get an iPhone made over there, or over here, or wherever for uh, way, way cheaper than you can get it made in Nebraska. But at the base of that, it's because the labor's free. The labor's practically free. Practically free. In Nebraska, you have to pay a, you have to pay a wage. There's going to be unions probably. Yeah. Off somewhere else where you make it for nothing. There's no unions. <laughs> There's no bargaining. And the theory is that by having free trade, eventually it will help those people over there who are working in the sweatshops because they'll eventually be affluent enough to to buy our product demand the sort of wages well and to demand the sort of wages that you demand in Nebraska and therefore everything gets equalized but except it hasn't ever happened right the comparative advantage is not in woolens or grapes it's really in labor and in productive employment you know the ability to, for people to support themselves is nothing that we would want to get rid of at any price i think and then when you look at the fact that, you know, like he says, that uh, that there there might be a time when your ships were torpedoed by submarines built with U.S. patents, all of that, that whole way of thinking looks crazier and crazier to me every day. And I used to be a, a anarcho-libertarian, free trade, free, free, open, I mean, everything. I'm just not anymore. I've been watching it for 40 years and it's just not been paying it. It's been long enough for it to pan out. And seen it. Yeah. And if you're going to think in terms of a racket, so Butler's talking about rackets in war. Uh, if you're going to make big profits and you are a little bit or a lot evil, that's a big word, you have no incentive for your labor force in uh, somewhere out east 
to unionize or to get good wages or to have healthcare bundled in with their contract or whatever. You don't want it to happen. You'll probably don't you'll probably help local politicians in those places that make it not happen. When did you become pro union? <laughs> when did I become pro union? I'm I don't think I was ever anti union. What bothers me is if you have if it's tilted, I okay. So I live in a state where we are in a real hole because of public sector unions, and a public sector union. The problem is they can't be fired. So if they go on strike and get a better deal from the state or better pensions from the state, there's no. There needs to be danger on both sides. We're in a mess in Illinois. We have a pension problem that will never be solved. And it's public sector unions, a union in a private company that is at risk of getting fired. Well, you takes your chances and you get the best deal you can. When everybody has something to lose, then maybe you can negotiate. Not at all opposed to that. And plus, I, I really got bothered when um, I read that story about Jeff Bezos's company. They seed their stores in order to prevent unionization. Yeah, they, they, they choose the socioeconomic class of the new employees there to make sure there's no unity among the workers. Hey, listen, guys, don't believe us. Go look it up. Go look it up. You could look it up. It's true. So I, I don't know. I was ever a completely anti. Just it needs to balance. We're just an you're anti-racket. <laughs> yeah. In chapter four, uh, how to smash the racket to the to the union sort of a point he says uh that we need to conscript the industrialists <laughs> but the uh let the officers and directors and high power executives of our armament factories and our munitions makers and our shipbuilders and our airplane builders and the manufacturers of all other things that provide profit in wartime as well as bankers and speculators then be conscripted to get thirty dollars a month let all the workers in these plants get the same wages, all the workers, the presidents, the executives, the directors, the managers, the bankers, yes, and all generals and all admirals and all officers. Everyone in the nation be restricted to a total monthly income not to exceed that paid to the soldier in the trenches. Wow. All right. Let me try to argue with him. Okay. General Butler, if you did this. But my free market. Well, well, if you did this, would you get the munitions made as quickly and as well? I wasn't quite with him on this, although I like the I like the the fire and the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. You need to get the best guns. You need to get the best guns made quickly. There needs to be some profit in it. And you could see this with the experience in East Germany or in the Soviet Union. We pretend to work; they pretend to pay us. Yeah, there's got to be some profit. His um, excoriation of them for getting these super high levels of profit isn't entirely fair. We get into a world war. And you and I own a factory and we make brass cartridge cases. I don't know. But we used to make lanterns, you mm -hmm. know, and we go tool up and we're making, you know, we're running three shifts a day, seven days a week, Christmas, New Year's Day, everything. Round the clock, uh, we had enormous costs in tooling and we start making brass 30 out six cartridges and then the war is over. And we probably don't make anything the next year. And we might not mm -hmm. make anything the year after that. You know, we've got to retool for our uh, back and uh, retrain and move back to our old industry, whatever that was. We got a contract to build our cartridge cases at a certain price. But we find out that uh, everybody needs brass. Everybody needs copper and tin right now. And our copper and tin prices are haywire. And, you know, we have to price it high just to make sure that we can even get it done. And um, I don't know that that's an excuse for having a 1,200% increase in profits, but uh, I think if we saw those numbers, not from 1914 to 1918, but if we saw an average profit across some of these industries from 1914 to, let's say, 1920, probably wouldn't look as nasty. It's also a different thing if, if Shoot Hambrick Brassworks mm. isn't engaged in promoting hostilities. True. Let's call it shoot brass. What you know what we used to make? Trumpets. Oh, is that right? Yeah. French horns. And then we retooled for the war. Mm. A different kind of music. 
So when you when you started off with that line, I was like, "Oh, the shoot family in Germany literally was making horns." No, I'm making that up. Oh, I have a great uncle, maybe a great great uncle. It's my dad's uncle, I think. Otto, who was in World War One, somewhere attached to General Pershing. I don't know exactly. I haven't been able to dig up his military history. Uh, can you imagine being named Otto Shoot <laughs> going into Europe in World War One? Uh, he brought back a, a, an officer's sidearm, a Walther yeah. 32 ACP. It still fires, and it shoots the shells out the wrong way. No, off the left. HF. Yeah, it's weird. I, I don't know why that is. Yeah, but that 32 ACP, that's automatic Colt pistol. That's a it's an American cartridge. You know, that's what he's talking yep. about. Or part of what he's talking about. And it might and it might go through your Carhartt overalls, point blank. Yeah. <laughs> it's not super powerful. No. His prescription here for putting everybody, you know, at this thirty dollar a month wage at that time and uh, making the officers and directors uh, of the armament factories and so on, you know, putting them in the trench. That's pretty extreme. But I think that we can take a lesson from that. You know, if, if we, if we're all going to war and your loved one's names can be drawn out of a hat and then ultimately die, everybody's name probably needs to be in the hat. Yeah. My kids and I were talking about this yesterday, but we were actually talking about China. You know, there's some saber rattling and posturing over, you know, American Chinese relations. And it's weird. And they said, well, you know, you could get drafted, Dad. And I said, no, I'm too old. Too old. And uh, that surprised the kids, but, but I am. I can't remember what the ceiling is on the selective service. I think it's 35. Maybe it's 38. I don't know. I'm looking it up. Well, if they want you, they'll get you. Well, but that's true. They if can they're drafting, they'll change the rules. If they're drafting, you know, I just turned 49. So if they're drafting 49-year-old, never have been in the armed forces people, we're in big trouble. Yeah, but that squad, though. <laughs> I like the second one. So another step necessary in this flight to smash the war racket is a limited plebiscite, which is a great word, to determine whether war should be declared. Uh, you ought to vote to decide whether to go to war. Now, we technically did vote. So if you read the Constitution, that old thing, <laughs> it says that the Congress shall retain, I think I forget the exact words, the Congress shall have the power to declare war. That's reserved to the Congress. The Congress is the representative of the people. Okay, so if the representatives of the people don't think we should go to war, we shouldn't go to war. When is the last time we declared war? 42, 43, something like that. My neighbor is a Korean War veteran. It was not a war. So that constitutional protection against going to war isn't there. So I'm just looking at the, gosh, Korea, no declaration of war. Persian Gulf War, no mm -hmm. declaration of war. They're all in, the only ones that were declared that I see is War of eighteen twelve, Mexican American War, Spanish American War, World War One, World War Two. Yeah, yeah. June of forty two, we declared war on Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania, and that was the last. Those Take were that, Bulgaria. Bul those darn Bulgars. I like to say Bulgar. I don't say that enough. We say Bulgarians. They're Bulgars. Butler says, only those who would be called upon to risk their lives for their country should have the privilege of voting to determine whether the nation should go to war. And the, as the Constitution's written, our duly elected representatives would do that for us. But we don't actually operate by our Constitution. We operate by some unwritten one that nobody really understands and we can't see and can't refer to. So I don't know what you do. I don't know what we do about that. Yeah, I'm just pulling up a song by the fantastic... Very important group, Black Sabbath. Mm. Luke's Wall slash War Pigs. Generals gathered in their masses, just like witches at black masses. Evil minds that plot destruction, sorcerer of death's construction. In the fields, the bodies burning as the war machine keeps turning. Death and hatred to mankind, poisoning their brainwashed minds. Uh, and the next verse, politicians hide themselves away. They only started the war. Why should they go out to fight? They leave that all to the poor. But that's what Butler's talking about. 
you know, who makes the decisions to go to war? Are they connected with the people that will bear the cost of going to war? I remember when I took business ethics class, there was a this thing called stakeholder theory mm. as opposed to shareholder theory. Oh, God. I know you're grunting about it, uh. right? which means that other people get to run your business. Yeah. And I didn't think much of it in the business ethics class, but this isn't business ethics. This is war and life. And if you're going to go off to war and die for your country, you probably ought to have had some representation to decide whether you ought to do it. Yep. And we do all sorts of wars that are real wars that we never declare and that nobody ever asks us. The good news is we aren't conscripting anybody right now. And uh, we, have, right. we have volunteers. It doesn't make it a lot better. It just makes it less bad that the people that are putting their rump on the line are, are volunteers and not being just snatched out of their homes to do this. I think it might make it easier to do more wars oh. because less and less of a share of the people are taking part for in it. For sure. So who even knows that we've been at war for the last 20 years? Right. Yeah, if you're from some upper class family in, you know, the Northeast, let's say, you know, you, you could potentially not know anybody that had been. But if you're from, some, from Appalachia or Puerto Rico, you know, every one of your cousins went to Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever. But they don't care about that. It makes it really easy not to even know about it. And that I think that might be, I mean, is that a feature or a bug? Depends on where you're sitting. Yeah. The third step in the business of smashing the war racket is to make certain that our military forces are truly forces for defense only. Ah, that's dumb. Why is it dumb? I kind of liked it. I, I like the idea, uh, but tanks aren't. Offensive or defensive, they are weapons of destruction. I don't know. There's some cavalry officer out there right now telling me, you know, yelling different. Uh, bullets aren't offensive or defensive. They're armaments, you know. So I think he should have been a little more careful here. I'm just being a, I'm just being a dick. He should have said <laughs> the, the business of smashing wars should be that we make certain that our military forces are used for defense only. Because there aren't just like categories of weapons that are defensive only. Defenses are defenses. Trenches, pillboxes, you know, think of the Maginot Line or the Atlantic Wall of Defense on the English Channel or whatever. But uh, he just didn't do as good a job here of talking about this as I would like. But then he gives some specific ways in which our military could be used for defensive purposes and not offensive purposes that I think are good. For example, he says, uh, no maneuvers in the Pacific. It's a great big ocean. He says, let's uh, limit all of our maneuvers to two or 300 miles from our coasts. I think that's a real good rule. The words in the middle of my page 41 from Jeff Bezos edition it, are pretty provocative here. So this is written in 1935, or copyright 1935. This is six years before Pearl Harbor. Uh, so he's talking about the the swivel chair admirals <laughs> telling us that we're menaced by a great naval power and we need a big navy. And then the Pacific is a great big ocean. We have a tremendous coastline on the Pacific. Will the maneuvers be off the coast two or three hundred miles? Oh, no. The maneuvers will be 2,000, yes, perhaps even 3,500 miles off the coast. The Japanese, a proud people, of course, will be pleased beyond expression to see the United States fleet so close to Nippon's shores. Even as pleased as would the residents of California were they to dimly discern through the morning mist the Japanese fleet playing at war games off Los Angeles. You want to rethink past wars? <sighs> I have the speech of Franklin Roosevelt. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. And then it lists what they did. So they bombed the American island of Oahu, which is interesting, the American island of Oahu. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack against Malaya, Hong Kong, Guam, Philippine Islands, Wake Island, Midway Island. Surprise offensive throughout the Pacific area. Okay, so you have to think. And I know World War II is the good war. I get it. It's the one we've mythologized. The music was good. Oh, sure was. I'll Be Home for Christmas. Mm. That, that's one of my favorite songs ever. 
Yeah. You imagine you're sitting in a foxhole somewhere and thinking that you, you'll be home for Christmas. You can count on me. Please have snow and mistletoe and what is it? Presents on the tree. Sorry. Gets me. And the Bing Crosby yeah. singing. But you think, wait a minute, where does the United States end? What do we end near the shores of Japan? The Red River. <laughs> and Hawaii, you know, was Hawaii a state at that point? No. So we were extended all through the Pacific. So who was who was on defense and who was on offense? If you don't like what I'm saying, tell me where I'm wrong and I will cheerfully say thank you. Okay? But I'm poking at stuff on this podcast. There's a Simpsons episode where uh, Lisa and Bart are just like kicking out into the air. And they're like, if you happen to walk into my foot, you know, I didn't hit you. You know, <laughs> it's like that. I'm going to start punching my hand out here. And if you just get in the way of it, it's your own fault. That's right. Yeah. So if you're doing yeah. maneuvers in the South China Sea and uh, China drops a tactical nuclear warhead and sinks your super carrier, I don't want to be hearing about any declarations of war. But he says, uh, let's limit these these ships to no further than 200 miles from the coastline. Planes can be permitted to go as far as 500 miles from the coast for purposes of reconnaissance. And the Army should never leave the territorial limits of our, our nation. I love that. We have military installations in, I don't know, over 100 countries. If we uh, brought half of that home and stayed right here and had all that military might, or half of that military might just concentrated right here on the continental United States, we would be safe indeed. But, uh, you know, invade the world, invite the world. It's uh, not a great idea. Well, we've been doing it for a long time. Since uh, Butler started his military career. <sighs> yeah. Uh, my book has pictures of, at the end of it, it's published by an anti-war group. I was thinking that uh, if we're going to read this book and be fair, we ought to probably read Storm of Steel. Hmm. Uh, but Ernst Jünger. Yeah, I'm, I love it. I wrote a couple of pages of it that I can write for sure, but it's a young man writing who liked war, giving the upside. This is a book giving the downside, which I think plays into my natural sympathies. we we'll probably need to read Jünger. Yeah, for sure. I think so. Yeah, Ernst Jünger's uh, Storm of Steel. Do we want to put that in the list uh, after Alistair McIntyre? Sure. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. So anyway, the, the edition that I have has a series of photos in the end, because the book is really short. Just some photos of war, horrible photos. You know, if you're going off for the great adventure, and there's like bodies up in the trees and flies eating a corpse and uh, mass hangings and executions and piles of skulls. You know... It, if you're going to go to war, you ought to know exactly how bad it is, and it better be for a heck of a good reason. It shouldn't be something that you do to advance a policy agenda. It's also corrupt and filthy. Chapter 5, To Hell With War. He says, an Allied commission, it may be recalled, came over shortly before the war declaration and called on the president. The president summoned a group of advisors. The head of the commission spoke. Stripped of its diplomatic language, this is what he told the president and his group. There's no use kidding ourselves any longer. The cause of the Allies is lost. We n now owe you five or six billion dollars. You as the American bankers, American munitions makers, etc. If we lose, and without the help of the United States, we must lose. We, England, France, and Italy cannot pay back this money, and Germany will not. Yeah, I wish he had evidence for that. He was a four-star general. He might have been there. Yeah, maybe he was. So you had to go to war to get the debt paid. Mm -hmm. Because if the Allies had lost, Germany wouldn't have repaid the money. Yep. We've heard of banana republics. It's not a clothing store. Shall I read? Let me read a paragraph from Info Galactic. Okay, yeah, yeah. Butler participated in a series of occupations, police actions, and interventions by the United States in Central America and the Caribbean, commonly called the Banana Wars. Because their goal was to protect American commercial interests in the region, particularly those of the United Fruit 
company. The company had significant financial stakes in the production of bananas, tobacco, sugarcane, and other products throughout the Caribbean, Central America, the northern portions of South America. The U.S. was also trying to advance its own political interests by maintaining its influence in the region, and especially its control of the Panama Canal. These interventions started with the Spanish-American War, 1898. There's monuments in Illinois to people who died in the Spanish-American War. Mm -hmm. Illinois farm kids going off and dying in the Spanish-American War. And ended with the withdrawal of troops from Haiti and Franklin D. Roosevelt's good neighbor policy in 1934. So Butler, after his retirement, became an outspoken critic of the business interests in the Caribbean, criticizing the ways in which U.S. businesses and Wall Street bankers imposed their agenda on United States foreign policy during this period. We went to war to protect the fruit company. Yep. War for fruit. Yeah. So all, all of that is well documented, the banana wars. I think there were some also some actions over r uh, rubber production, sugar in Haiti, well-documented history of doing this. And so his allegation here, but this commission's report told him that these munitions, uh, these munitions manufacturers and others would not get repaid. It jives. And how about this? Does that meeting actually have to even take place for you to know that, you know, you've got the DuPonts making explosives. You've got the Dow people, chemical making explosives, U S steel, all of these industrial interests that are selling material to the, what were they, the allied, allied forces in World War I. You know, you don't even have to have that meeting to know that if England and France lose this one, they're not getting paid back. You don't even have to have that conversation. So I don't need sources here, and I don't even have to read the transcript of the audio to, to know that this had to be part of the calculus. We have enough evidence of these sorts of things happening. It's, gosh, you know, wouldn't you just rather be Achilles? Well, that's what Junger... Being dishonored and then just fighting it out. Y like, Junger shares a lot with Achilles. Yeah, I haven't read it yet, so does it, is this going to be a spoiler? No, I don't think so. It's been a long time since I've read it, but but he sees something glorious for himself in it. I think that can also be true, right? Like Winchester repeating arms can be making a whole bunch of money in that war, but you as a young man can learn something about yourself and accomplish something and, you know, find glory and self-actualization in it. All I'm saying is it'd be cleaner if it was just... Achilles and Hector. <laughs> well, the problem is that the, the people in the Trojan city, you know, but if you could have just called out Hector in Paris and said, let's go, right. that would be awesome. Like me and Trudeau with it, sledgehammers. <laughs> <laughs> trying to think which world leader I would get in a duel with. Oh, Angela Merkel. Like, if I pick, it's me and her. <laughs> piano wire. That's If, if, if I go to <laughs> get in a duel with her, it's piano wire. Oh, goodness. <laughs> she might be old, but she's feisty. It'd be tough. I might do drone strikes. <laughs> That's your duel? Yeah, we each get drones. <sighs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> I like, uh, for me, my edition is page 44. It's right to the end of chapter five. This thing is real short. When the, our boys were sent off to war, they were told it was a war to make the world safe for democracy and a war to end all wars. Well, 18 years after that, the world has less of a democracy than it had then. This is 1934, 1935. You know, Mussolini, Hitler, Franco. Oh, gosh. The Bolshevik Revolution. Yeah, where's the democracy that you've made the world safe for? Besides, what business is it of ours whether Russia or Germany or England or France or Italy or Austria live under democracies or monarchies, whether they are fascists or communists? Our problem is to preserve our own democracy. Regime change, installing democracies all over the world, is, has been a fetish, I say, of U.S. foreign policy for a while. And I don't think it has ever worked. It's so crazy. You know, it can work. It can work. But what you have to do, nobody wants to do this. You have to kill every single person on, in that country who's capable of waging war against you, which is pretty much all the men and all the children, all the boys over 10. You have to kill every single one of them. And then you have to steal all the women and make them have your kids and make them part of your nation. That's the only way it works. 
Go read history. That's the only time it wins. That's the Melian dialogue. Look, Scott's not making this up, and I don't think he's in favor of doing no, it. No, not at all. Okay? But this is what the Athenians did to Melos. You know, submit to us. No, we're going to fight it out. Well, they killed them all. Kept the women alive. Made an Athenian colony. Yeah. There's been a movement towards, you know, guerrilla warfare and asymm asymmetrical warfare now for decades. And part of that is because war is almost entirely limited at this point. But for the, for the Greeks, it wasn't. If they're going to take over Milos, they're really going to do it. They're not going to wait till you say uncle and then pretend like everything's okay and wait for you to like sneak in and kill the Athenians in their sleep or ambush their mule carts on the road back to Athens or dynamite the Piraeus. They're not going to let, they're not going to let that happen. They're going to kill every single one of their enemies that could potentially harm them in the future and rape all of their women and make them carry Athenian mm. babies. That's the way it was done until mm, 1700. And by the way, that's the only way it works. It's ugly and it's not fun, but you wishing it worked another way doesn't mean that that's true. I would just rather not do it. Right. If you're in a position where it's showtime, that's what you need to be willing to do. And if the problem at hand doesn't warrant that kind of brutality, then you don't do it. Right. War is not a recreation. War is not to advance your banana business. My goodness. That's infuriating. I was li watching an interview with John McAfee. Oh, gosh. He's so great. Last night. <laughs> is that the one he tweeted about where he said, I've been drinking and I'm high and I'm going to go on and have an interview. It'll be fun. <laughs> well, he was pretty drunk. I don't know what other things he had done. But talking about the war, he well, he was three sheets to the wind, but... He talked exactly about this sort of meeting. It's like he read this book, which he probably has because he's, you know, 180 IQ. Super smart. His, his life's kind of a ruin, I, in my opinion, but super smart, on the run. <laughs> <laughs> but talking about people going into to W's office and saying, Mr. President, Iraq has nuclear weapons. And that the president is a, a man sitting in a chair it has been a man so far. But it's not the head of the government. The three-letter agencies that come in and tell you that there are mass weapons of mass destruction somewhere, which nobody ever found, and get you to do things. What? I know guys from both Gulf Wars. Uh, I had a friend in college who went off. He came back pretty different. Mm -hmm. Pretty different. He wouldn't talk about it. But there was some interest in doing that, right? War is a hell of a thing, and it might be a necessary thing, but you ought to know that it's a hell of a thing, and not going to war needs to be worse hell than the hell you're going to bring on the world by going to war. Does that make sense? Yep. And if you don't think it is, then you tell the Canadians they could take Fargo. Yep. If you're not willing to kill all the Canadian males <laughs> over 10 and impregnate all of the women... Then you best not do it. All the Canadians are on the Hallmark Channel movies. They are. It's entirely Canadian actors. Well, they're they're so moderate. <laughs> I'm gonna be immo I'm gonna be immoderate here. Uh oh. I'm gonna start some trouble. Ulysses S. Grant and his ilk invaded Mexico a number of years ago. Yes, they did. A number of years ago. A lot of people don't know this. We don't talk about this in our American history class very much in public schools. Our armed forces went all the way to Mexico City and made the government of Mexico capitulate. Mm -hmm. And then we left. And then we left. When they capitulated, we got, we got, I'm making air quotes here that you can't see, uh, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, California. You got to know that California, New Mexico, Utah, Arizona was... Mexico. You know how Utah is full of Mormons? It's because they fled the United States and went to Mexico, but it was where Utah is now. Mm -hmm. We got that land, but we didn't kill every single one of them. Shouldn't have. Shouldn't have. They're going to get that land back. 
because that's how it works. Well, nobody wants Utah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but they're going to get that back because that's how it works. Go read your history. I got 3,000 years worth of military history you can read. And if you don't prosecute a victory to the most broody, blood, bloody end, by and by, sometimes it takes a couple hundred years, you end up losing. Ask the Carthaginians. You can't. There aren't any. They're all gone. That's how you win. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, and Scott is quoting the wonderful book that you ought to read, Starship Troopers, where uh, the teacher of, what is it, moral and history and moral philosophy, history and moral philosophy, makes that point. Ask the Carthaginians. You can't because they're all gone. Man, I hate all of this. You know, <laughs> this is... But how mad am I going to make people with my Mexican war analogy there? To me, that's just patently obvious. And I'm not saying we should have killed them all. We shouldn't even fiddled with it. You should have left it to them. Yeah. Why'd we go to war with Mexico in the first place? Was it economic interests? It's not clear to me. Yeah, why? Hmm, Mexican-American war. What was the reason for that? Remember the Alamo? Well, yeah, it's not clear to me what the what the whole darn deal was about. And just because you read a particular answer doesn't mean uh, we would know anything. So here we go. 1845, Polk, the newly elected U.S. president, made a proposition to the, American, or the Mexican government to purchase disputed lands between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande. That, that offer was rejected, and Major General Zachary Taylor moved into that disputed territory. They were then attacked by Mexican forces. See? There we go. Who killed 12 U.S. soldiers, and off we go. So we were the aggressor. Yeah. Okay. I don't think you should do it, but you shouldn't do it and then not win. Yeah, and we didn't win that. The belligerents were the United, United States and the California Republic. Uh, but out of that, we got Mexican recognition of U.S. sovereignty over Texas. Just an utter mess. An utter mess. Mm -hmm. And all of the Confederate and Union generals uh, learned how to be soldiers in that war. Yeah. So it's like a, a prelude to the Civil War. Here's how to fight. Yeah, and Zachary Taylor, who moves into the disputed territory, he ends up being president eventually. Uh, Grant is with Taylor in Mexico City when they signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Isn't Lee with I them? I think Lee's there as well. And uh, Grant ends up being the U.S. president as well. You know, it's just it's just a mess. Shouldn't have been there. Grant writes about it in his memoirs. Everything we mention, we need to read. Got to read that too. Yeah. At the end of this thing, he talks about we need to have more disarmament conferences and limitations of armed conferences. I don't really agree with that. I don't think that stuff works. There's no way to check the other guy's math. There's no nobody actually shows their poker hand. There's no way to know. Uh, I think it's mostly window dressing, you know, what, what, what good are the salt talks when you really can't know what the Soviets are doing in Siberia? But if we take his very strong defensive posture, I think, I think we win. He's in his posture, his strong defensive posture is much different than Teddy Roosevelt's walk softly and carry a big stick. Smedley Butler's is sit on your ass and build a fence Mm -hmm. And I like that a whole lot better than the walk softly, carry a big stick thing. Because you can't walk softly if you've got gunboats off the coast of China or off the coast of Japan in 1907. That's not walking softly. Right. That gunboat diplomacy stuff from the TR era is disgusting. He's the first globalist. globalist screw that guy. <laughs> you know, McKay loves him. Well, he's got some virtues. He certainly does. But But they're all negated by... This idea he had that the United States was a young country and must prove itself in war. You can go look at, don't never believe anything I say. Go look it up. He thought that that was true and he agitated for uh, big time military action. The words you said about the necessity of prosecuting a war is absolutely not you saying we ought to do this. No. It's you saying don't do it because this is what you'd have to do. Cause, so if you go stir up the hornets and you don't kill every hornet by and by. Here, this is some Catusta. They'll lay dead for you, and you're going to get stung. They'll play possum, yeah, and then you'll get stung. 
Yeah, we talked about Thucydides. So I, I run seminars on Thucydides every now and then. I think maybe you ought to run one for fun. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thucydides is frustrating. I think all of you out there in, I was going to say radio land, except it's not radio, in podcast land. I like that. Let's say that. In radio land. (laughs) I have to do a radio voice. If you've never read a history of the Peloponnesian War, now's the time. How is that? Yeah. And don't listen to Dan Carlin talk about it. All those Dan Carlin podcasts are so GD long. You could just go read the whole thing. (laughs) Read it, and it's very frustrating to me, and I think it was frustrating to, to gosh, that word's hard to say, Thucky died as, frustrating for him, too, that these people are killing each other. I mean, there's this scene where, the like, the Thracians are on their way home, and they just stop in a school and kill all the kids in the school. Good Lord. That's how you win. When I read it, I think, how do you get peace? And it's not peace and love will win the day, put flowers in the gun barrels like they did at Kent State. How do you get peace? And I'm thinking, and I asked this at the seminars, and my current best answer is you be Switzerland. Hmm. Well, You live in a place that nobody cares about, and every single one of you is armed to the teeth, and you never leave. You live in a mountainous country, you have complete and total unity, and everybody's geared up. And then you never go anywhere. And everyone around you needs to understand that the prosecution of war must be total or you ultimately will lose. We had some notion of that when we dropped atomic weapons on Japan, I think. Of what in particular? Of the mountain country? Total and complete prosecution of war. Mm, That's a heck of a decision that Truman made. It's a heck of a decision, but we ain't had much more trouble out of Japan. Although... They did a great deal of harm to our industrial capacity and the wealth of average people in the United States as they retooled with new technology and new machines that we showed them how to use. And uh, their transistor radios kicked our ass for a long time, and their Toyotas are still kicking our ass. And it's not all about, you know, economics, but there's still a conflict there. What's a good reason for an offensive war? I don't think there is one. That's a quick answer. Then all you need is a defensive army. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of a category error thing. I mean, our army is just blades that cut one way. You just need an army that's really good at breaking stuff and killing people, and you put really tight rules on how it's to be used. Yeah, you never, ever want to use it, but you want it to be really good at what it's never going to do. And by the way, if I found out that Trudeau was amassing troops 150 miles inside his border, we had a deadlock certainty that they were launching an offensive on June 6, 2020, and we did an incursion and destroyed that military. I wouldn't say that was an offensive war. But you have the problem of like, what's a deadlock certainty in terms of, you know, your military intelligence, reconnaissance and all that. Because uh, we've had all kinds of bogus shit like Zimmerman telegrams and weapons of mass destruction and all kinds of things in the past. So all all that's tough to figure out. Yeah, it seems really easy to go to war. And, uh you know, there people write books and they and they make songs. At, l- imagine, like that. I hate that song. Imagine John Lennon. It's my least favorite song in the world. I've heard it played in churches. Can you believe that? Yeah, I can. But... And like Kant wrote a book, Perpetual Peace. He's worried about it too. How do you get peace in a world full of humans who are, we have to admit it, pretty warlike? Yep. We like fighting, or we wouldn't keep doing it. Seems like it. Yeah. This thing's frustrating. Uh, There's a couple of of facts around this. The listeners might want to look them up. Some things I never learned in history. So I never learned about the Bonus Army. 1932, some 43,000 people camped out in Washington. On the main mall. (laughs) The camp was mostly on private property. But when the army came to bust it up, they didn't care that it was on private property. And the army fired on U.S. veterans. And among the people in that army was Douglas MacArthur and George Patton. Yep. Firing, in this is in the Depression, firing on veterans who are peacefully demonstrating to get their bonuses. I never knew about that. Yep. Hoover ordered it. I wonder if it's why Hoover lost. Part of it. There's a, this line. So Hoover sent the army. FDR sent his wife. 
crazy. Uh, the Liberty Bonds, I looked up, and this happened in 1934, that the Liberty Bonds were going to pay you in gold. Hmm. Well, we went off the gold standard, defaulted on Liberty Bond 4, yep. refused to pay up. Yeah, there's a reason to believe that the government has filed bankruptcy in the a couple times in the past, <laughs> quietly. So uh, there is some crazy stuff happening. There is so much stuff in history, that, in American history, that you don't know. Why don't people know it, Carl? Because history is written by the winners. Often it's written to forward an agenda of the people that pay for the book. Yeah. And we have gotten into this disgusting conflict of interest where we let the governed be educated by the governor. And that's just utterly insane. I cannot understand it at all. So what happens? You have public schools. Well, what are public schools going to teach? They're going to teach things that are convenient and conducive to the public, and the public is the government. And so if there are stories to tell, there are stories not to tell. If FDR is presented in your history books as a hero, well, you're not going to talk too much about the internment camps, and you're not going to talk too much about provocations and war games off the coast of Japan, and you're not going to talk too much about defaulting on the liberty bonds when you stole everybody's money by going off the gold standard. Yep. I'm, did I say too much? Nope. I, I was going to go farther, but we'll leave it there. Oh, Butler, this is a short piece. You ought to go print it out, carry it with you till you get done reading it. It's a short one. And uh, in today's words, Carl, I think that he is railing on the deep state. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I'm wondering if I'm getting... Uh, am I too feisty today? Am I too political? Nope. <laughs> nope. They're all dead, the people I'm talking about. Yep. The so. problems aren't dead. Uh, but at, no. at the end of this thing, one more little chunk here before we get off of his shoulders. A smart guy. Smart guy. His business and his trade is war. And he says right at the end, victory or defeat will be determined by the skill and ingenuity of our scientists. The last three or four paragraphs there, he makes some predictions about uh, how it's going to be our engineering skills and our technology that wins wars. And of course that's, you know, of course we know that's true. You know, when the sharps rifle showed up, uh, showed up in the civil war, you know, people that didn't have that were in trouble. When the Mauser rifle showed up and we were using old crag rifles, we were in trouble. Uh, it's, it's been, it's always been the case that the, the phalanx was, was hell on the disorganized infantry. And, um, it seems obvious uh, but we still need to remember that because if you are continuing to build super carriers and an inexpensive tactical nuclear warhead can send one of those to the bottom and break your global military hegemony, you better pay attention and not put yourself in a position to lose that. Mm -hmm. the, what's the story? Generals generally fight the last war. Yep. The old tactics. Yep. We are definitely doing that. The technological environment we're in right now will allow some weird insurgent people to use a $3,000 drone and fly it into the air intake of your F-35 joint strike fighter or whatever the hell it's called and destroy it for mm, five grand total. That much? We're going deluxe, you see. <laughs> so you need to be really careful about, you know, we need to really think about what the technology looks like and what kind of engineering this requires and put ourselves in a position if war has to be total for it to be proper you have to be careful about getting into it and then once you're into it you have to know you win you have to put yourself in a position to win the thing or don't fight it or don't fight it either one of those situations is existential like if you don't if you're not willing to kill all the canadians then you have to be willing to give up fargo lose all the people of fargo fargo's lost forever then heinlein says Ask the Fargo ones, <laughs> you know, and they're gone. <laughs> do we have any, do we have any listeners from Fargo? Of course we do. Have I? <laughs> of course we do. So, uh, you know, because it's such an existential problem, either winning or losing, you've got to be good at it. I don't think we're that good at it. And I, I don't, I'm not deucing on the people that make that their business. I just, you know, it's the old saw, like you said, that they're, they're preparing for the last war. 
And uh, I've talked, I've talked to some military guys that I've coached and uh, that follow some of our podcasts. We'll DM back and forth and Instagram and, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we we lost in, in enormous amounts of material in the Gulf region to just that very kind of thing, you know, remote control vehicles and drones and, and stuff like that, you know, and, and that's going to just ramp up and be more and more difficult. <sighs> Whatever. Just give peace a chance, Scott. Hmm. We should do a music and ideas podcast where we just deuce on John Lennon for two and a half hours. <laughs> hate that guy. <laughs> don't at me. I don't hate all of his stuff. <sighs> just some of it. You're not a Beatles fan at all. That's the problem. You know, I'm not a Beatles fan. I'm not going to say not at all, but the Beatles stuff that I like the most is Paul McCartney's stuff. And I really like their early, early stuff. You know, I, I really like their bubblegum stuff. I want to hold your hand. And it's fantastic. What what catchier and sweeter thing could there be than that, you know? Baby, you can drive my car. <laughs> is that about cars? Uh, yeah, it's John Lennon probably. <laughs> You've seen his taste in women. He, there's no innuendo with that guy. <laughs> so, anything more about Smedley? I, I feel like I've gotten, he's gotten under my skin, and I've probably gone too far to his side, and that's why I suggest we probably ought to read Younger mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be balanced on this. You always, I think I, I always want to argue with myself. Oh, I always say that I believe the last, last thing I read. I'm constantly in a whipsaw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's because you're Emersonian. Right. Right. I am a, I am not consistent. No, well, but you're thinking every day. And if today you think something different and it's time to record the podcast, that's going to be what you, hmm. you think today. And the, the problem with a podcast is that it's out there. The internet's forever. Yeah. There's always that worry turning this microphone on. You know, what am I going to say? What are going to, you know, whatever. I'm going to say what I think the day that I record the podcast and I'm going to reserve the right to change my mind uh, if any of you out there change it. I'm already inclining to his opinion and, and so I'm reading it and it's it was too easy for me to agree with him. Major General Smedley Butler Peacenick. Yeah. Like I said, I had wanted to read this for a long time and when I read it, I was a little bit disappointed. It's a It's a nice polemic. I'm glad he wrote it. Mission accomplished. I think his project worked. Um, but I was expecting something a little more philosophical and a little, uh, a little different. Um, uh, but that's my fault, not his. Mm -hmm. If you're a junior high through 12th grade, maybe even, maybe even freshman in college history teacher teaching American history, I think that you'd be well served to spend two or three days on Smedley Butler's war is a racket. If I was a ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade teacher, uh, running American history class, um, or even well, or, or even world history, I would work this in. I'd probably get shit canned, but uh, <laughs> I would work this one in. Uh, we ought to probably leave one thing. You people ought to look up the business plot. <sighs> yep. Apparently, allegedly, the New York Times says there's no evidence for it, which means, of course, that it happened. Especially the New York Times in the 30s. The New York Times in the 30s had. Oh, I forget his name. Durrani, Walter Durrani going, saying that Stalin was great. Yeah. And there was no famine in the Soviet Union. So this is the... <laughs> They've never retracted or denounced any of that stuff that he said. Or given back the Pulitzer Prize that he won. No. There was a, a, a plot, apparently, a political conspiracy to overthrow President Roosevelt. And they tried to draft, in Butler's words, they tried to draft him in to be, what, the head of the government? <laughs> yeah alex jones would have loved this guy would have been awesome it's not too far from reality this is look it's 1933 what's going on in the world then everything you had the october revolution in 1918 actually in november because they were on the julian calendar you know you had spain that's a trivial pursuit question it was like who's buried in grant's tomb right like, when was the october revolution november november all sorts of things happening all over the world and uh, a, a completely impoverished United States ripe for some kind of fascist takeover. I don't think it's too far-fetched. No, nope, they tried. When you read about bonus armies getting shot at, crazy the stuff that was happening that we never hear about. Yeah, it's still happening. So, next week, 
we're going to talk about Alice Dare McIntyre. A L A S D A I R McIntyre's book uh, after Virtue. Yeah. Which is slow going for me so far, Carl. I've enjoyed it. He's made me think a great deal. And that's why it's so slow. Uh, it's going to be a good one. And then the week after that, we'll do Ernst, E R N S T, Ernst Junger, J U N G E R, his book, Storm of Steel. He lived 103 years. <laughs> Hard living. Did a lot of living yeah. in those years, that guy. He did. Yeah, we'll talk about that more when we when we read him. The McIntyre is a, a hefty text. It's um in ethics, in philosophy, it's one of those ones you have to read. And he's one of these damn continentals. His thesis, he states his thesis in an analogy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but it's an analogy. Well, I want to save it for the podcast. Yeah, we will. It's it's really good. It's real important. It's about whether we actually can have any moral conversations anymore and what went wrong. Yep. So it's kind of a detective story. Everything is. Yeah. Hey, I want to read one review, but before I do that, hey, please go to your favorite podcatcher, whatever that is, whether you listen to Overcast or Downcast or the iTunes app or Google Play or Stitcher or whatever the heck it is, and hit the share button and share this thing on Instagram so your people could see what you listen to. That would help us a lot. And then if you got some time, go leave us a review like this one here that a guy left or I don't know. Someone left. I can't pronounce this name. It says, Diamond in the Rough World of Podcast, Carl. It says, I stumbled upon OnlineGreatBooks.com as part of an ongoing adventure into the world of classical education. These guys are phenomenal and brilliant and also totally lacking in any kind of pretentiousness. Well worth a listen in the five stars. <laughs> Looking forward to joining the next seminar group. That's very nice. I don't know if I believe you, but uh, <laughs> that's awfully sweet to see. No pretentiousness. I have to tell my wife that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not pretentious at all. You're done. You're already pretentious. She can't say that. <laughs> well, she'll just listen to it and she'll hear that very nice review. And then she'll either bust out laughing or say, that's the man I love. Ah, that's true. Well, there are a bunch of good reviews on here. And so thank you, you to everyone that has yeah. left those. And, uh, you know, we got a sister podcast. Is it a sister? It's the Music and Ideas podcast. It doesn't get as many downloads as this one. So I know that not all of you are listening to that show, but you oughta because we give music, different different genres, different artists, different songs, uh, different stylings, the same sort of treatment that we give these books. And we do that with our partner, music, uh, Michelle Hawkins, who's smarter and uh, nicer than both of us. So you might enjoy that show if you like this one too. Most recent one was about... Uh, uh, the singing brakeman, Jimmy Rogers. Oh, we've, we've done one on Toto. We've done some on Brahms. We've done uh, some Bach fugues. We've got Stevie Wonder coming. We've got some weird Hungarian and Russian choral music. It's you never know what you're going to get over. There. I believe it's Bulgarian. Uh, Bul yeah, that's right, Bulgarian. Don't confuse the Bulgars with the Huns. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the not the last time I'll make that mistake. There is another <laughs> online great books podcast. Listen, listen, guys, go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast and sign up to join us. And you can read along with us. Carl leads some seminars and our friend John Pascarella. Michelle will read lead some every now and then. After a few months, you'll get to uh, Thucydides and we'll cover Thucydides in two months there and really do a deep dive on uh, the military action and the political action in that book. That thing is heavy duty. When the first time you crack it, it's really dry. It's like an old bad piece of roast. Like the more you chew it, the bigger it gets in your mouth. That's what Thucydides is like until you start talking to other people about it. And then you can start to kind of tear that thing apart and get, get at the good in it, that's in it. That's a such an important book. Yeah. It's a treasure. Thucydides says the book might be lacking in romance. <laughs> For sure. It's pretty funny. He's self-aware about that. But it, it is, uh, he thinks he's writing a book for the ages. Mm. And I think he did. And you'll learn more about politics reading that book than you will watching CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, whatever it is that you go to get, get your mm. news. Is the History of the Peloponnesian War a more important book than the Iliad Curl? Oh, don't make me say this. <laughs> I'm so happy. You're evil. Uh, probably. Yeah, I, I think it probably is. It's not a more beautiful book. It's not more wonderful. But if you had that 
and you were a young prince somewhere, uh, you would be ahead of the guy that only had the Iliad, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good one. It's a must read. It's not super fun, but it's absolute must read. What else? I don't know. I think that's it. We've beaten this very short book to death. Yeah, it was a good one. I'm glad we read it. Thanks for doing that with me. And Mm -hmm. uh, we'll just talk to you guys in another week. Mm -hmm.